Our text for today is taken from the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin, sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, to the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. First thing I have to start off with is we know that last verse of this text, don't we? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know that there's a decent pastor who hasn't made you memorize that passage for catechism class. But if you look at the context of this text, that passage takes on a little different meaning than we sometimes think of it as. We're going to be talking today about one of those hard questions. How do you know you are a Christian? If you sin and do things wrong, how are you better than anybody else who sins and does things wrong? And so we look at that question as a sainted professor of mine always would say in class, as he was dealing with these teachings, teaching us, he would often say a Christian insofar as he is or she is a Christian. And he was dealing with that narrow road. How can you sin and fall away, but yet be a Christian? And there's times that people have come to me and asked me that very same question. Well, guess what? That's our service theme for today. A Christian, insofar as he or she is a Christian, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that a Christian isn't going to sin. But there should be a response to that sin, a sorrow for that sin, a repentance, a turnaround. And that's the important factor here. A Christian isn't going to be perfect. We don't invite people to church so they can come and watch us be good. We come to church because we all need the Lord. The negative is obvious to see. The wages of sin is death. He calls us slaves of sin. And because of that slavery, there are consequences. Well, we just saw that this morning, didn't we? The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins, it shall die. And there are some that try to say, well, babies don't sin, Pastor. I said, well, do they die? If they didn't sin, would they die? The answer is, yes, they do sin. But here's where the trap unfolds. Slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, looking to more lawlessness. Fifty years ago, did you ever think we would see the United States where it is today? And the things that we see around us. 
the lawlessness on top of lawlessness. Where you can't even define what a family is anymore. Here's the whole problem that once you in, get involved in the sickness and whether it's an addiction, whether it's any sin. While you might have been young, you would have thought, I'd never do that. The second you do, it becomes easier to go back and back and back and get even worse. We've seen this with the church bodies in the United States. How they've, instead of embracing God and sticking to what God says about things, they've gotten worse and worse and worse. By accepting lawlessness as their motto, their creed. I've seen this in people that I know who spiral out of control. It's an easy thing to do. It's a sinful thing to do, and we're all sinners. There's a temptation that eats at every one of us. And Paul so precisely hits it. It's not just the lawlessness, it's not just the sin, but the desire to keep going further into sin. Slaves of sin. If you've ever worked with someone who has been abused, you see it that even though they might be set free from that abuse, they still find it somewhere and continue in it. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. When you were slaves of sin, did you have to care about anything of God? No, you were free to chase all your desires. And it's interesting that he's here speaking to the Romans because we know some of the craziness that happened in Rome. The parties, orgies, all kinds of interesting things. Just look through some of the inner rooms of ancient archives in Rome and you find incredibly lewd and interesting things. And here's where the rub comes. Paul says, were you happy with that fruit? Or do you now regret what you did? And of course, he's speaking to Christians. And the, of course, the response needs to be, yes, we are sorry for what we did. We don't want to have that anymore. We don't want to be proud of that. And slaves of that anymore. These things are complete opposites, aren't they? They lead to very different things. If we are sinners and we want to sin more, we know what path we are on. But then God calls us back and gives us life. And that life will want to do something. We see beautiful examples of life here on the altar, or on the organ, don't we? From the funeral today, a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Life, spiritual life is going to be beautiful, show its beauty somehow. Whereas following sin, not going to show that kind of beauty. They can't be together. As so many liars try to say they can be. Oh, we can embrace all these sins and these lawless things. But you're forgetting someone. You're forgetting God, who did not call us to be sinners anymore, but to rescue us from sin. And 
And one of the passages that Jesus even says, but as he's going to his crucifixion, he said, there's going to be a lot of you that will come and say, well, Lord, we followed you. And he's going to say, get away from me. I have no idea who you are. Well, but Lord, we thought we were following you. Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. That same word that Jesus used is here in the text. Paul is referring back to what Jesus himself taught. Repentance. Having shame and remorse. A change. These are the blooms that God's people bring forth. And what Paul even saw in the Romans, that they changed because of Christ. Because of the Holy Spirit. And we know that for a fact too, right? It takes an act of God. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's not something you can do to yourself. It's something that God has to do to you. That's why it's so important for us to hold on to baptism, the wonderful means of grace. And if you read only certain sections of scripture, you might think, well, those that are doing good are good and those that are doing bad are bad. And that's just the way it works. But it also comes from the heart, doesn't it? There are some that are going to want to do good and say, oh, I, we love you so much, and yada, yada, yada. And then when you, after you've given them their gift, how have they treated you? Some that will put on a show. But God seeks to make a change in you, to free you. So a Christian, insofar as he or she is a Christian, is going to do Christ-like things. A number of our members of our church today got together, came here early to set up, bring food. Most of our people waited till everybody else who was a visitor here got their food. We showed our love to one of our families, to the departed. This is what Paul is talking about in our text. He talks about our works. And then it gets into that weird passage at the end that we started off with, right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And what he is doing here is he's taking you back through this. How did you do any of these works that we just talked about? It was because the gift of God was acting in you. Freed you from the lawlessness. Freed you from the desire to keep on sinning. It's caused you to rejoice. I was having a conversation with one of our members who had commented how and how things have changed. He goes, you know, why would you want to go to church and leave negatively? Just be yelled at all the time. If there's no joy in going to church, what's you're doing it wrong, aren't you? I'm like, yep, you're finally getting it. No, I'm just kidding. But God wants us to follow him, to rejoice in him. And here's a trap that Christians get into, too. When you look at sinners and you see them doing things and you think, well, I wish I could get away with that. <gasps> Where are you? Are you in a good place? Or are you wishing you could sin more and more? If you look at God's word and see all the commands that he gives us, and oh boy, you should come to church with me and be as grumpy as I am. We're missing something, aren't we?
God wants to see that childlike response in us. Just like every little child goes and picks dandelions for mom. And I know that it happened in my house. And I know how horribly Julie sneezes when stuff like that comes into the house. And yet she did it anyway because she loved the response or the love that those children were showing her. Can you imagine this on God's level? All of those little things that we do in love because we've been changed by him. That's what he's talking about in our text. That we would want to continue more and more and more in them. Not look at the sinner and say, boy, I wish I could get away with that. But wanting, how can I be more like God? Part of that is as well, Jesus knowing sinners. Did he sit down with the woman at the well and tell her she was okay without him? Like we see happening in the world today? Or did he sit down with the woman at the well and say, you know what? You need me. You've been married five times and the guy you're with right now is not your husband. Jesus wasn't here to condemn her. He was here to save her. And as much as we need to preach against sin and preach against lawlessness, there's the other part of it, isn't there? Maybe we've got to preach the gospel a little bit, you know, get that into the sermon somewhere, maybe even at the end of the sermon. President Orvik and President Peterson used to teach, tease us about this all the time in the seminary. Orvik would come down from his office from time to time. Some of you know him. His voice, don't make the ladies angry with you and keep the false doctrine to a minimum. And they had, the two of them had different phrases that they would use about, yeah, making sure you got some of the gospel in there every so often. And of course they were jesting. The gospel has to dominate, doesn't it? Yes, we cannot go along with these sins because the end is destruction. But if that's all we're leaving people with, we're not doing our jobs either. As I want you to think about the words of this text, as I want you to think about the sermon and what we've talked about today, I want you to think back to the words of the psalmist. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Here I hear about how bad I am. But I also hear about how much more my Savior loves me. How much he is willing to wash away. To purify me. To desire me. To have me called by his name. That's our precious gift from him. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all our human understanding. Let that peace be with our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. And uh, we go back to doing something. It's called the offering.